we go again. And before we even get underway, we've got it. Yes, we've got it. It cost us millions to secure the rights, but we've done it for you. We've got George Graham banging his head on the dugout in the quarterfinal of the Cup Winners' Cup. Roll that videotape. Welcome back, my friends, to the show that never ends. Although, to be honest, I thought this one had. When we closed the book on own goals and gaffes, volume one, I really thought that is the most comprehensive study of fumblers, fraudsters, fiascos and faux pas you can milk out of any one sport. But over the last 18 months, things have been happening. Well, for a start, uh, footballers have been allowed to play football again, which means we are guaranteed a, a, a rich seam of newly minted disasters. But by no means all the clips you're going to see are from the modern era. Oh no, there are things on here that the perpetrators must have hoped, prayed, wished, had been whacked over long ago. They must have hoped the dust had settled on these blunders. But we've got them. Our research is exhaustive. The journey begins again. Anderson steaming up outside him on the overlap. McDermott looking for Waddle. Metcalf there, and he's put it in. That's an own goal. As the TV cameras follow an irrelevant player, we must look at the crowd. Mr. Bean never got such laughs. Stuart Metcalf's our man. He treats us to a feast of close control. But a lot of Leeds players have already dropped back. And Charlton comes forward quickly. Can Hamilton get in on this one? Now, I don't think this goal is Paul Maidley's fault, actually. This clip comes from the notorious 1973 season, when the FA allowed Ipswich to experiment with the controversial radio-controlled ball. Operated from the bench, it could waggle around goalkeepers and make even the best defences look like pea-brained weasels. As you know, the radio-controlled ball was banned after the radio signals were linked to premature baldness in the Charlton brothers. Tommy Craig to number nine, McDonald. And it's a goal! And the new boy, Dave Jones, who puts through his own goal in the very last minute. I hate new boys, don't you? New boys always spend their first few months at a club screwing up shots and scoring at the wrong end. By the time they've got it right, they're the old boys, and the club give them a free transfer to Fulham. Of course, Fulham's old boys end up at your club, where they are the new boys, and we begin again. It's nice to notice at the end of this one the tableau of despair. Composure in the goal mouth. That's composure in the goal mouth, everybody. So often Arsenal look for David O'Leary coming off the near post. Two own goals. You can imagine the discussion in the pub afterwards, can't you? Oh, that new boy's coming on, isn't he? Yeah, I didn't think it was much cop at first, but you know, two goals in ten games, you can't argue with that. Yeah, I know, but I've heard that Fulham are sniffing round after him. Cooper coming up. Remner. Leaving it for Giles. Jones chasing, and oh, no goal! It's an own goal by David Sadler. David Sadler heads the ball over Alex Stepney's head. An own goal by poor David Sadler. Trying to head that ball away from Mick Jones. Turned it over the top of Alex Stepney, who'd come out too far. A good thing to watch out for here is the copper sitting behind the goal. He's supposed to be impartial, of course, but I suspect he's a Leeds fan. Watch, he starts to applaud, and then suddenly remembers his position. Add <coughs> in, add in. Let's have no undue celebration of a poor old David Sadler's own goal, eh? Even if it does mean I've won 60 quid on the police sweep. 
It's pathetic sometimes how commentators cover for their colleagues. This is quite clearly a Martin Buchan own goal. But listen to the smokescreen ITV invite us to believe. Acceleration made something of it in Steen's header. Now, was that in? Was that in? Looked to me as though Stepney pulled it back from over the back. line and the referee Cue given Brian it. Moore's red faced voiceover. In, in fairness, we had to look at this half a dozen times to realise it was an own goal by Martin Buchan and not a goal by Colin Steen. Watch the red number two there. The ball goes off his head, Martin Buchan, and beyond Alex Stepney into the back of the net. Own goal, Martin Buchan. Yeah, we knew first time. Lynch. coming into the near post, so is Edvaldson. Oh, and it's a goal! An own goal by Willie Gardner. Four minutes into the second half. Now, here's a textbook lesson for all you kids hoping to be the next Martin Buchan. If ever you're defending the near post against an awkward chip cross, remember it's essential you head it gently but firmly towards the unprotected part of your goal. This is where your goalkeeper will expect it and will be waiting. This defender's goalkeeper has let him down. Honestly, what are training grounds for? You know, up until I was about 12, I was a goalkeeper. I think a lot of us were. But it's at 12 that a boy starts to change. Not only physically, but we begin to notice girls and parties and life in the fast lane. And we, we literally want to play the field. But not all boys. Some boys, even after 12, remain placid and calm and staid and don't mind just waiting in the shadows. Some boys remain goalkeepers. Now, 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 we really shouldn't laugh at them because they didn't develop like the rest of us. We shouldn't laugh at them because we were lucky. We, we shouldn't laugh at them, but... So Bobby Moore right in there, adding a little bit of support now to what is a desperate attack for Fulham. Lacey was right in there, and oh, he's punched into his own goal by Stepney! Terrifically funny motions from Alex Stepney, slapping away at the air like a punch-drunk old boxer woken by a sudden alarm bell. I love the way he just collapses when it's clear all hope is gone. Mm -hmm. But as usual, the dope of a director cuts to a bunch of players who, though happy to take credit for it, had nothing to do with the action. It is this sad gathering that the world wants to gloat over. Goalkeeping blunders are like world wars. We shouldn't be amazed that they happen. We should be staggered they don't happen more often. Craig, and a good shot is in. David Craig scores for a second time in a week. Although a clanger like this is a little too close to home. Anyone watching this who's ever played in goal over the park knows that these shots come at you in slow motion. And a little voice in your head says, go on, drop it. Just for a laugh. And Best once more bursting on that scene and played there nicely by Perrin for Best to Hamelon and Jackson and he's there! Oh, a mistake by John Jackson and Best has scored again! Now I'm with John Jackson on this one. I don't think it crossed the line either. He gets a hand to it and remember the whole ball has to cross the line. I think that John manages to scoop this out while there's still some doubt. In the end, the Russian linesman gave it, and England took a 3-2 lead over Germany. The rest, as they say, is history. It was the number five, Dennis Lawton, who very nearly put through his own net. Wait for it, wait for it. So it's a corner for Tottenham. Short for Knowles. Hit in by Knowles, and well taken. Oh, well, what an extraordinary goal. What an extraordinary goal. The goalkeeper threw it in his own net. Yes, thank you, Brian. My mother's in the stand. His first game in the Football League, 21-year-old Tony Bell, his first appearance. Ah. And he took that ball so well as Knowles shot it took it cleanly and threw it in his own net. Yes, thank you, Brian. You know, they talk about bringing bigger crowds in, they outlaw back passes, they alter the offside, but if you really want to bang the drum of populism, you've got to offer the public plenty of this. 15-year-old goalkeepers in fuzzy wigs performing humiliating aerobatics on their debuts. Let's face it, there are a few other ways he could have drawn attention to himself, 
He could have played a blinder and kept a blank sheet, or lit a Catherine wheel and dropped it in his shorts. We want ten. Francis. Oh, he missed it completely. Now, does that go in? If not, Stoke are hardly trying to scramble it clear, are they? Now a goal's been given. Jim Cannon got up there, first of all. Oh, I don't know about you, I didn't notice anyone getting up there. It just seems to me that the goalkeeper's got his Duckham's gloves on. And watch, even when the gormless defender thunders the thing home, he still attempts to uh, go for it. Paul Maidley, 36 years old now. He's played better passes than that. Now he has to check to cover John Hollins. And an own goal by John Lukic. John Hollins, who must have thought he'd seen most things in professional football, finds Arsenal going in front with an elementary mistake from poor John Ricks. Here's Sansom, who will keep it in. Hollins joining Sunderland and McDermott in the middle, and it's Hollins! And that was surely over the line. And this time, John Hollins will get the credit for sure. The deep cross from Sansom had picked him out. Sunderland let it run for Hollins. The shot was hit well, but it was straight at Lukic, through his legs, and just over the line. Yeah, like John Jackson's was just over the line. One ball forward there, McFarlane versus Joe Jordan. And Jordan's got past him. Todd really coming back hard. And still he got it in there to Kenny Dalglish. Could be very interesting. Say no! Between his legs a goal. Ray Clemens prostrate on the ground. He probably makes one mistake a season like that. And it happens to come at Hampden Park. Dalglish the scorer. Terrible mistake by Clemens. Ray Clemens. Well, a heartbreaking afternoon for him. down between the two Williams oh! Williams delighted in case you missed it at normal speed the birth of this nightmare can be glimpsed in the most ludicrous little panicky skip that the keeper gives immediately before the shot he's already tap dancing when what's that yes yes deflection but there's no excuse for effeminate pantomime I believe he studied at the night classes given by this Icelandic genius. They say there's no such thing as an easy international these days. Well, this bloke puts an end to all that nonsense. Aided and abetted by some of the modern game's most adrift defending. The cross comes in, he gets distance on the punch. There's a muddle and note the delay before the defender computes where the ball's gone. And he's the type of man who believes the ball has to touch the back of the net for it to count. No goal! Here Ian St John sums it all up in a few well-chosen words. <laughs> <laughs> the moral here, of course, you can create a synthetic pitch, but it will always be brought back to earth by real boneheaded players. Deep cross. And Campbell Money lets the ball slip out of his grasp. What a complete disaster for the St. keeper. Yes, thank you. That other keeper's mother is still in the stands. Still, it's an absolute peach of a pearler here, and of such rare idiot choreography that it does shake your faith in man as nature's last word. Burn. Oh, and Larry May joins the attack. Oh, super! Well, hey. No, mate, no. Larry May will get the credit. I think it actually went in off the goalkeeper in the end. Oh, you do, do you, John? That's probably what it did then. Well, Larry May volleyed that from 25 yards. It hit the underside of the bar, came down, and I think it actually may have gone over the line off the goalkeeper's body. Here's a goal so bizarre it's creepy. Handball, everyone loses it, catastrophic back pass, goalkeeper's foot vanishes. Literally vanishes off the end of his leg. That must be what he starts appealing for immediately the ball goes in. Ref! There's no end to my leg. To which the ref says, I think you mean your stupidity. 
Our next clip is the perfect antidote to those slack-minded panty wastes who attempted to bland the 94 United States World Cup into oblivion. It's a referee who headbutts players. There you go, a typical piece of work from Mr. Colin Nuttam and Cuttam Ashton of Dimchurch in Kent. Seen here restoring law and order to a situation that without his reserve and experience might have incited the crowd. You know, I'm so glad we live in the times we do, because they say in the future nobody will actually play anything. We'll just all don helmets and experience sport as virtual reality. Now, that's not for me and, and it's not for you too. So give thanks that we live in the glorious age when we can experience football in the full splendour of virtual stupidity. Here's an absolute cracker from Les Ferdinand. Look at the height he gets. And watch as he mutters something about flaming goal was right in front of me. From the reverse angle, we can see what a difficult chance this was. Ah, if only he'd been fit against the Dutch. Hanging on at Anfield in the last minute certainly does something to defenders. They throw shapes you only normally see when a wasp gets in your tent. Neil Ruddock didn't score that, of course, but he's happy to take the applause. Here we go again, and watch that 15. <laughs> Now here's proof that if you're Paul McGraw, you can get away with anything. No screaming fits at Big Paulie, watch. The 17 tells him, that's a couple. From the cross, Les Ferdinand attempts the clearance, muffs it, and rather than handball in the area, Paul takes the gentleman's way out. That's a couple. A moment ago, we saw Neil Ruddock taking a lap of honour for a goal he didn't score. How bizarre, then, that when he does, he seems almost shy about it. On the replay, watch number 21, Dominic Matteo, in an ugly moment of ball balloon turmoil. It was just one of those days when the balloon refused to go in. Oh, but Liverpool touched bottom at times during this season. He says Sean definitely got a touch on it. Sean can't be as intimidating as McGrath because there is an outbreak of glaring in the area and it's a superb statue reflex from Bosnich. Watch this. This is extremely reminiscent of Tony Adams' goal that beat Torino. Perfect. The deftest, most gentle of touches cleverly right into the danger zone. Of course, in his private life, Tony Adams gets an extremely bad press, but I know Tony, and the truth is it only takes one drink to really get him drunk. Trouble is, he can't remember if it's the 26th or the 27th one. How's this for attacking the ball? And on the replay, a rare chance to hear just what it is fans do say when leaping around celebrating. Yeah, who could argue with that? Here's a terrific example of what I call the trailing leg syndrome. I'll explain more in a minute. On the face of it, it's a forgivable muddle under pressure. Although it doesn't bode well that Norwich appear to be twinned with 93-94's poorest side, of whom more shortly. The reverse angle reveals the true perils of the trailing leg. So you put all your thoughts and calculation into leg one, leaving leg two to fend for itself. And which one does the cross hit? Yeah, that's the theory of the trailing leg. Well, just about now I'd have been saying, not a short one, we never score from short ones. See Terry Fennick coming across here to explain exactly what's just happened and how at the end of the season when Swindon are safe, they'll all be laughing about it. The actual effort here includes some very, very funny leg bending work. And look, 
Behind the goal in the grey, isn't it nice to see Clive Grandad Dunn still enjoying his football at the age of 106? How much of this lecture do you suppose Kevin Horlock actually heard? Occasionally, footballers get bored on the pitch and just start acting weird. Look at these headers, strange maverick movements, and Lee Dixon becomes intoxicated by it all. Study this closely and you'll see Lee's bonts make the heading movement after the ball has made contact. And if you thought that was a peculiar action for a human to perform, what's going on here? Still like Swindon, Oldham luckily had no reason to rule moments like this at the season's end. And it's here that the goalkeeper picks his moment to deliver a personal message. Oh, I forgot to tell you, your girlfriend rang up for the game. She says she's packing you up, OK? Do you know, I still can't decide if this goes in off of boot, bum or hand. Now, if you were a manager, wouldn't you get the message that somebody here is wasted in defence? And like Lee Dixon, watch as the head directs the ball a split second after it has waved bye-bye to his hairline. Southampton versus Oldham, a crucial game and a difficult chance. Watch the boy leap from the crowd to deliver a one-word critique. And what's this? Another example of a teammate offering sympathy and encouragement. Well, no. The close-up on the replay shows that perhaps for once, footballers do talk to their teammates at times like this, rather like you and me would in the same situation over the local park. This is Oldham and QPR and a glorious fiasco. This is made all the more daft if you look at the Oldham supporters who turn to taunt the away fans, but there aren't any. Here's an exception, the ball, who to explode at. Everton had a shocking season. And a fantastic moment when the defenders clash like two big, dumb American wrestlers. And then, there's some squirming on the line, which is not the sort of thing that would get a kid noticed at a club trial. This may be controversial, but you'll understand. You can't beat a good sending off, can you? Pep's up again. A good sending off is much more exciting, let's face it, than a flowing move. I mean, the last World Cup, for instance, it was a superb affair, beautifully staged, a big event, but it was a bit nice, wasn't it? The FA must understand. FIFA must understand. You've got to have bad guys. Crowds love it when some teams are wearing white hats and some teams are wearing black hats. At this point, I would have loved to have brought you some of the most controversial sendings off over the years. Yes, some of the most vicious tackles. But still, the authorities won't wear that sort of thing. But we can examine in discipline. The practice style of Tommy Smith. You watch. Pulls up one sleeve pulls up the other sleeve, then pulls the first sleeve down again. That's just how angry he is. And we might have seen his Clive Thomas crazy gesture, but for that bloke the FA paid to hover in front of cameras during dramatic moments. The actual marching order's walk is more of an unrepentant trudge. And like Sammy Chapman, wait till you're out of earshot of the referee before calling him a flying picket, which was a very big insult back in the 70s. 
Ah, now here's Maradona unrepentantly trudging off. This is included because A, he's a paranoid little twerp with a messiah complex, and B, it's weird to notice that he once weighed under 20 stone. These days he looks more like me. Although I haven't been sent off since this memorable day at the New Den. Flying worker was the new twist on the old Sammy Chapman phrase. This, of course, is the great and legendary Terry Hurlock, who, you see by his eyebrows, was one of the few players who took the field with boxers' grease on their faces. While we're about it, here's a tremendous piece of theatre starring yes. Francis Lee. And Francis Lee is going to be booked for that. And Malcolm Musgrove is being called on, and this is turning into a very expensive football season for Francis Lee, who has said that he will give 50 pounds to charity if he's booked but he was booked last Saturday and again now having already been in front of the disciplinary commission this season and he's suggesting absolutely graphically that it was a dive ah the mighty Francis Lee goal machine and tragedian and just look at the front of his shirt. When did you last see any of your players sweat for your club anything like that? Did I lie to you? Are we sweating for you? Isn't this a great tape? And there's so much more to come. This next section, for instance. There's nothing more annoying than these people who say, I don't know, you can get so excited about a lot of men kicking a ball around. Strangely, those sort of people never like that argument applied to tennis. But of course, it isn't just a lot of people kicking a ball around. Once you've paid your money at the turnstile, there's so much more on offer. Here's a cute moment as we eavesdrop on a little mascot working out with his hero. So, you want to play for Liverpool when you grow up, do you, son? Yes, yes, I do. Yeah, well, there's no hiding at Anfield. You have to give 100% every game or nothing. Still, the great thing is they'll pay you even if your performance sucks. <laughs> hey! Yeah, it sounds like the job for me. So tell me, son, uh, how long have you wanted to be like me? Always to tell me, Dad, I want to be just like Ian Rush. Ian Rush? <laughs> I'm John Barnes. You, you're John Barnes? But I'm on the pitch with John Barnes. The shame. The shame. Uh, yeah, well, listen, son, I think that's the referee's whistle. Why don't, why don't we go and find your mum and dad? Because, uh, <coughs> really, there's a lot of people in. I've got a job to do, so why don't... Uh... <coughs> Sometimes it pays to do something so outrageous, you'll be given the benefit of the doubt. Vinnie Jones there. He wasn't going that way at all, was he? Here's poetic justice. These officials with their po-faced rules on celebrating, interfering like big-nosed old bags from temperance societies in the Old West. Well, this one comes too close. It's football, for God's sake, not fencing. And, way over he goes. So perish all tyrants. This was lying in the archive without explanation. The referee has fallen over and is in some discomfort. Which is always worth a laugh. But next, he flips out completely and nuzzles Billy Bremner's codpiece. Then came a public cry for help. Do we have a registered FA referee or linesman report to the office... And there is an appeal for any registered FA referee or linesman to report to the office. And a gentleman is taking his coat off in the tunnel below us. Yep, from out of the crowd stepped forward and, uh, some old boy with a kit and everything. Oh, I'd love to do that. I would give some very bent decisions. Speaking of which, how many times have you seen a penalty cancelled because the keeper wasn't ready? Two one. David Harvey saying he wasn't ready. David Harvey is saying to the referee he wasn't ready for that. He was picking bits and pieces. Now Harvey doesn't look quite ready, but Clement certainly is. Two one. Now Mr. Burns going across to have a word with the linesman, who may well take Harvey's side. And that's just what he does. Yes, Harvey has made his point. 
David Harvey was picking bits out of the goal mouth when Dave Clements took that, and the linesman interceded on his behalf. So we'll all remember that one. Still, in those days, at least it seemed the crowd were allowed to have a laugh. And the Park Lane end, just a little reluctant now to release the ball. So the police have got to go in there and look for it too. They thought they got a ball for the park tomorrow morning, but they haven't, and Spurs have got a goal kick. Or a could of you? Spectators have come on the field towards the referee, a couple of girls, in fact. But they've come on to mob Harry Redknapp. Well, nothing too sinister about that. And perhaps Harry enjoyed it. Did they get away, or didn't they get away? A policeman's got in too. We're forgetting the football, but nothing's happening at the moment. Leave them alone. And I think the police are going to win, but it's going to be quite a battle. The crowd are booing, and Bolton has taken the goal kick. These football hooligans, eh? Only one language they understand, right? Well, I think the policemen are winning, yes. So the cost of giving Harry Redknapp a hug... Go on, girl. Stick them both in defence, I say. Here's an instance when all those long hours on the training pitch pay dividends. A dummy run from the 10, allowing the referee to ghost in, and it's the simplest of tap-ins for him. Watch again. The 10 takes the attention away, and with the keeper waiting for the chip, the ref gives a call, and he tucks it away with the minimum of fuss. Yes, he's quite right to celebrate. Here's one right out of the playground. At least he laughs about it. I'm beginning to think Ryan Giggs thinks he's too talented to allow for such basic dumbness. Yes, of course. That was uh, Ince's fault, wasn't it, for moving about so much, Ryan? Now, obviously, the keeper should have saved this. When you watch the replay, you'll notice that the ball is moving like a bullet. And once it's passed his hands, there's only one bit of his body he could have stopped it with. And to be fair, nobody loves a club that much. How about this winner from Laughing Neville Southall? Let's be honest here. Sometimes an error is so basic as to be lame brain. And men, being men, have to charge around pretending to be hurt and outraged. But as women will tell you, that's what men do when they're embarrassed. Neville, it's a goal, and it was your fault. One very overused phrase is that one. You'll recognise that was Ronnie, not Jürgen Klinsmann Rosenthal, responsible. But what sure are two phrases that'll get you chased out of Stamford Bridge? One is, with the price of property round here, isn't this place a waste of space? And two, you know, I kind of miss Dave Besson. The two upcoming goals are from the notorious match in which Dave set out his stall in the transfer market. This second goof might be termed hats off to Gary Sprake, and it's a dreadful glimpse into a private hell. The crowd begin to show their appreciation, and in fact, the following day, both shots were reconstructed under scientific conditions. And yes, nine out of ten people in the crowd's mums actually did save them. By the way, uh, how's George doing? <laughs> hey, good man. It's back to the own goals again now, and I think some of the best we ever brought you. For what it's worth, the previous section of own goals were out of the Premier League. The ones we're about to see are from the Football League. But it doesn't matter. It's purely cosmetic. Own goals are the international language of football, the Esperanto, if you will. Own goals are the great leveller. Nottingham Forest versus Grimsby. Conditions cool, breeze light, pitch perfect, outlook optimistic, goalkeeper a lunatic. It 
takes him a few seconds here to figure on a scapegoat, but then he lets the world in on the real culprit. It's, uh, it's, it's that bloody loose shin pad. Must do something about that before next week, or it'll make a fool out of me. Actually, uh, where is that goal in case I see the ball again? Ah, there it is, buddy. If ever there was a case of no danger, then this was it. Right up until our man picks the ideal time to inject a little Stephen King into the proceedings. Perhaps the first rule of goalkeeping is always get your body fully behind the ball. However, if you're Fulham's Jim Stannard and want to bring an element of fantasy and fun, then try to grab that sucker while sideways. Yes! There's a nice reaction here, though. Calm acceptance and reassurance. Don't worry about it, fellas. Here's another wild example of taking your eye off the ball, the pitch, the planet Earth. Reminds me of at school, where after picking sides, you got lumbered with the gangly school loser. So you stick him in goal, figuring he must be better than nothing, but... Almost sounds like a compliment, mate. No one's better than you. Now here's a bullet header from a oh. bullet head. Cracker get on the end of this one. I think the goalkeeper might have done better with that. From Peckers cross. He can smile, it's 4-1. He had plenty of time to see it, and Eric Young put just enough pace on it. Plus, I hear goalkeepers like him at that height. There's Robinson. Comes forward, and we've seen him hit good shots this season. Here's a chance for Beecham, and it's gone in. Marshall has flicked the ball, and he's flicked it into his own net. Watch the referee dash in to break up the world's smallest celebration, as well as the clumsiest. Joey Beecham obviously will get the credit for that, but it wasn't the fiercest shot I've seen all season. No, that was Eric Young's header. You'll notice that the ball is not simply helped into the net. It is catapulted there whilst minding its own business. See the meagre handful of confetti that greets his misery. Actually, that's his contract. Now, this is where your TV becomes a stark mirror to life. It's a dreadful hash of an own goal, but a prime example of fan reaction. A man in green puts both hands to his head. A man with a carrier bag goes to leave, but like us all, isn't sure how to do it. In the slow motion, you might like to count eight V signs, 12 silent screams, five heads sinking to knees, a dozen bursting into tears, and a little boy who says, does that still count as a goal, Dad? Ah, my Millwall. I remember this Peterborough's horrible green kit on a Tuesday night. We were at the top, they were at the bottom. On the night, we were really awful, and they were full of fire, fight, and invention. Brilliant, ran us ragged, had the home fans applauding. Two minutes from time, that was the only goal. Hey, hey, we went on to the playoffs and they were relegated. How's that? An entire season in a nutshell. Mind you, I think that must have been the best Peterborough played all season. In the blue here, they were usually well up to this standard. And yet, ladies and gentlemen, they were relegated. The key to this peculiar shape-shifting must be that Peterborough's ground is built on an old Indian burial site. And when the spirits are displeased, the posh, they play like heap big crap. Believe me, them spirits must have had the permanent hump for about 80 years. shame really because that was such a fluid movement up till then fluid movement yeah there is another word for it but I've got too much respect for you now watch for the signal everybody out they're gonna score it for us look look that, that ought to be impossible didn't it they've set their stall out and hung on it a big sign help yourself Everything's free today. The flying defender actually knees himself in the nose. And he shuts his knees, but leaves his feet a yard apart. 
You think things can't get worse? Well, we don't just throw these tapes together, you know. This is worse. It's Fulham's Jim Stannard again saying, you can't let that stand, there are cameras here. On the replay, just as the ball sails over him, listen for somebody laughing out of control. The keeper can't believe it. Everyone here saw that happen. And now that they know, he's going to have to kill them. Take a look at this. I'm not sure who to blame for this one. I'm tempted to blame Norwich's John Polston from Volume 1 of Own Goals and Gas, but that might be stretching it. As we watch it back, we can see two players with but a single thought. That is, how can I quit the game and earn some real money mini cabin? You'll have noticed that I do try to find something amusing to say about each of our clips, but some are so, so incredible, words turn to ashes in your mouth. Now, how unlikely was that series of events? How much does it make you love this insane, glorious game of ours? Rewrite the rules, hype up the PR, take it to the States. This is association football to me, every bit as beautiful as the work of Eric Cantona. Here's the same match, and I'm on the edge of me seat here, figuring out what could possibly happen next. Stripes are on the attack this time. Stripes? Ah, of course, the old reckless didn't look mad 30-yard back pass to certain death. I do love the resigned way his shoulders sink. Immediately, he releases it. Uh, you know, there's only one way to deal with defenders like this. On the way home, pretend to hear a noise from the back of the coach, send him out to investigate and drive off. It's the only language they understand. Now, this may be the weirdest own goal on the tape. After a routine build-up, it spins into the path of Cruz number 11, whose crackpot attempt at a clearance sends the ball fizzing into the six-yard box, where it changes direction completely and bounces lamely into the net. How dare you claim credit for that goal, sir? If you watch, it's a 25-yarder that I suspect defies all the laws of physics and makes nonsense of the life's work of Stephen Hawking. Ah, if only everything in life were as reliable as Peterborough. You know, they do say nothing goes right for you when you're at the bottom, but I suspect Peterborough do this sort of thing just for fun. It's a simple nod, but he takes two attackers out of the game. Now, here's a great example of somebody's creative ambition being denied space to blossom. For me, he picks it up far too deep and then attempts to dribble his way out of trouble three yards behind the goal line. On the replay, you can see the goalkeeper gets an all-important non-touch. Then we see some lovely aggressive technique, but like his manager, I'd like to see him play a little further forward. Oh, no, hang on, hang on. I thought we'd spoken about this. I thought we agreed not to include anything from that game. Oh, no, what an awful moment for Clark Vanden Howe. Not just for him, I'm telling you. It's 3-0. Derby can start booking the coaches to Wembley. Oh, really? Do you really think so? That only made it 5-0 on aggregate, mate. Oh, and for the first time on this tape, we're going to see this one three times, are we? No, 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 no. It's in the contract. I said, if, you, if you're going to show that game, I'm walking out, and that's it. I, I appreciate your work here, but let... All right, I'll do, I'll do it just... I'll do it because I love, you know, football, and, the, and for, and for all, all the people out there, I'll continue with the tape. But honestly, a contract ain't worth the paper it's written on these. No, let's get on with it. The worst thing about that, you know, we could have gone up into the Premier League had things gone right for us that night. Had things gone right for us that night. And, and when it didn't, lots of friends of mine who support Premier League clubs said, you couldn't hold your own in that division anyway. Oh, really? Both Alex Stepney and Pat Jennings are that rarest of creatures, goalkeepers who have got on the score sheet. Now welcome, with a slight difference, Mark Crosley. Ah, here's
is a man conducting a self-examination and finding the patient mentally incapable of standing trial. I've seen rodeo riders bring down wild cattle with less fussing and fighting. And just when he thinks he's got it, the ball steps up another gear. Manchester City show the importance of the man on the line. It's Peter Reid showing the fine balance needed for a player manager. Here he's playing. And here he's managing to look a complete berg. I don't know who the attacker is, but watch for a bit of top-class finishing here. Goal! Uh, then it falls to trusty Paul McGrath. Who knows something terrible has happened, but is in shock. I mean, he's literally lost the power of a speech. What, Paul? What? is Richard Shaw, a man who makes supporters feel good about their own haircuts, knows it's better to concede a corner than concede a goal. No, hang on. It's better to concede a goal than... It, it's, it, it's better to give than receive. Better, better to, Every cloud has a... What is that expression? Oh, yeah. Boss, I want to transfer. The all-too-common sight here of Sheffield United under pressure and forgetting which one's their elbow and which one's their... The replay's only worth examining to appreciate the stat me, sir, Mark Allman style three times around the fountain, dangerously camp flourish of the referee's wrist motion. Is it my imagination, or does Terry Phelan really not have a lot of luck? He's got a wonderful, oh sod it, I give up body language. Really gets my vote for the FA's own Tony Hancock in shorts. Like Hancock, he means well, yet his dreams, ambition and work rate only conspire to make him look a bigger Charlie than ever. Still, when you look at it, this is just rotten luck. One of the very best on the tape, this. There is no danger. Repeat, there is no danger. Fully grown men fully blown panic. Here's Tottenham at Sheffield United, on their way to a 6-0 defeat. And what was Andy Gray thinking of? Hard and to the floor. Yeah, that's where the keepers hate it. Dean takes the congratulations. But when you look at it, his was a lousy, lazy cross to nobody. And by the way, that nobody used to play for Crystal Palace. Strangely, as did our next scorer. It's Sheffield United's own John Pemberton. Crystal Palace, football's own clown academy with graduates everywhere. Don't forget, managers, it's Crystal Palace, football's red-nosed troop of entertainers pratfalling their way into the nation's hearts. What are you doing? Uh, oh, I see. OK, OK, I'll lay off. OK, I'm just enjoying myself. I'll forget it. Mind you, if you think Pemberton buried his chance... Now that I could watch all day. In fact, I think I will.
Now, despite the cup final, people do say that Chelsea at Old Trafford have the Indian sign over Manchester United. Well, that may be so, but I get the feeling that on this occasion, the Manchester United supporters are giving an altogether different sign behind the back of Steve Clark. Brave chance though, he puts his head in where the boots aren't flying. Clock the passive non-reaction from the Sheffield Wednesday supporters on this. The score must have been about 8-0 at this point and one more can't possibly matter. Yeah, we've all been to these end of the season fiasco games where you simply give up. And the noise of the opposing fans, that is just annoying, because you're trying to have a chat about work or boxing. Ah, the mighty, mighty Premier League, eh? Hey, it's been a long time since we heard from our pal. <laughs> no, not that one, the, the real hero of the tape. I'm talking about Jim Stannard. You know, while we've been making this, letters have come in. Listen to this. It's from Mr. Monroe of Felixstone. He says, Dear Dan, could you please reassure me that the wonderful antics of Fulham's goalkeeper are still on view to the public? I have a nine-year-old nephew coming to stay with me at the weekend, and I've promised him a trip to see the great funny man. Well, rest assured, Mr. Monroe, Jim, when last seen, was still packing him in. In fact, here he is, Mr. Monroe, in typical mid-season form, creating something out of nothing. From the replay, we can see there was some danger at one point of him making a fine save, but it's all built up to the main event. Ah, that flick is nowhere near as simple as he makes it look. Now, to be honest, we didn't know where to put this next clip, but like Dennis himself, we just couldn't let it lie. United player down injured, and Steve James and Fitzpatrick and Law. There's a fight, in fact, between the United players on the field angry with each other and Dennis Law in the middle of it David Sadler as well angry obviously with Mallory who is acting very wisely and sensibly as a peacemaker but obviously Law full of anger and anguish that this two goal lead should have been lost and there at the end exactly as it should finish well he was furious with Fitzpatrick for not doing his job at the back but that really was the heat of the moment, and that was Dennis Law. Getting away from Woodward, giving it to O'Neill. O'Neill finding Payne. Payne a nice dummy. Now gives it to O'Brien. Towards Davis, and on the goal! He's done it, Davis has done it this time. McAllister got it between his legs, but couldn't hold it. No, he couldn't hold it, but he does try to stop it with three separate parts of his body. First it goes left leg, right leg, then in off the cheeks. Whatever happens next can't be as bad as his choice of shirt. Although that said... Oh, well, it's all very well putting your hands on your hips and pouting, but if he had taken it first time instead of flinching like a Mary Ann, he wouldn't have forced his goalkeeper into this mighty leap. Johnston has done it again. I think Brian's stealing the glory here from France's famous bats. Notable for making the most acrobatic saves, here he gropes like a man feeling for a piece of liver in a vat full of motor oil. Now back into Europe, where they've so much to teach us. Yeah, well, if that's true, then Jim Stannard is teacher's pet. This game actually took place in Albania, where for this one error, they gave the man life imprisonment. No, worse, they sold him to Fulham. He must have had a bad lawyer. Oh, now, quick, call everyone into the room, ring up the neighbours. This one's unforgettable. Look at the 
bench. It's wonderful here how once in possession, his mind goes a total blank while his defender tries to remind him. Just boot it. Just boot it. Just boot it. Just boot it. He's trying to let that one run. He's not catching out. Robson's ball forward. Keeper came a long way. Hendry surely. 1-0. And the Borough are off and running. And it was Robson at the heart of it. And Hendry on the end of it. And the whole gate end is jumping. Why is this commentator choosing to ignore what actually happened? Robson's at the heart of it? If Robson's the heart, what part of the body are these two blokes? And on the very same day, just a few hundred miles to the south, a very similar exercise that makes you wonder why goalkeepers bother wearing boots at all. In fact, you may argue, why do any of Southend's team bother? The whole shenanigans begin with a kamikaze back pass, and then goalkeeper Paul Sampson realises the hopelessness and watch him roll around looking for that foul. And the hits just keep on coming. Goal! How upset is he? That's how upset he is. And so is the kid in green behind the goal. Freshly relegated Oldham have learned from their mistakes. They've learned them and they can repeat them upon request. Just 12 months previously, they were causing all sorts of problems for the best in the land and they came close to killing off Man United. This match is at Port Vale. That's why they call it the drop. While we're talking big guns, Rochdale v Chesterfield. A key fixture, apparently here being played at some secret jungle hideaway. Nice to see Kenny Sensen refereeing. As we watch just how difficult this keeper makes it for the forward, we have to ask, what on earth is going on here, groundsman? Is this a floodlight or a lookout post in case the Indians attack? Why are Coca-Cola advertising here? Where is Lord Justice Taylor when you really need him? How very different from modern Wickham. A modest club only in the league a couple of months, but already they've learned how the big boys do it. You'll notice that long before the actual shot, this keeper's legs are just asking for it. It's Lincoln v Torquay, everyone! And watch, behind the goal, they're all wearing those shirts. Actually, I'm saddened to see there's building work taking place here. Pretty soon, football grounds containing big, view-obstructing concrete posts, there's a good example, will soon be a thing of the past. Now it's Rotherham v Bournemouth. See a defender shot out of a cannon. And how reassuring, he's the captain. Where's a view obstructing concrete post when you need one? You know, the polite view is that there's an awful lot of good stuff played in the bowels of the Football League, but comfortingly for traditionalists, there's also a tremendous amount of reliable old crap. And here we go, it's Scunthorpe v Northampton. Curiously, some seats still available. Yeah, okay, okay, mind out the way. What 
you suppose Henry Africa's of Scunthorpe actually is? In it goes, the youth in grey points the way. Quick enough to give us the bends, we're back in the Premier League, bang up to date, and John Lukic is in awfully familiar form. In fact, the remarkably similar Lukic blunder we saw earlier in the tape was in fact recorded a full 14 seasons previous to this, which of course proves that styles may come and styles may go, but football itself remains the same. And I don't know about you, but that makes me feel just wonderful. Then again, some things, some players, are simply unique. Here comes the most ingenious goal there never was from the greatest player there ever was. A moment of free-thinking, bona fide football genius denied because of a befuddled, confused and panicking official. Who'd be a footballer, eh? who'd be a football supporter. For me, and for the history of football, this constitutes the biggest gaffe in the archive. It's little wonder, is it, that after a while, George Best gave up bothering at all. And that's virtually it. Didn't we promise you some fun? Don't you just want to wind it back to the beginning and start again? That's what we're going to do around here. Own goals, gaffes, you can't whack them. Hilarious, hysterical, always, like this one. Ha, ha, ha. The stage is set for England's last and decisive match in this uh, World Cup qualifying group. England in red, San Marino in blue. England needing to win by a seven goal margin and hope that Poland can do them a favor in Poznan against Holland. I'm sure you're aware now of what's at stake. And Bacchocchi, number nine, picks the ball up straight away and San Marino launched the first attack. Oh, and a mistake by Stuart Pearce and San Marino had scored. I don't believe this. Galtieri, extraordinary start. San Marino have scored in the first few seconds. Galtieri, the little number 11. Stuart Pearce tried to pass the ball back to David Seaman and goodness me, Trevor Brooking, what can you say? I know what I said. I know exactly what I said. I remember it word for word. There were six seconds gone and I said, Oh, f 